you know, I, I'm I'm ready to jump in. I got a few questions. I'm not sure if um, she shared them with you or not, but we can just go off the cuff and just have a, a, a good conversation, I think. Great. I'm into it. Very good. Um, all right. So, Eli, who are you? The same one that asked that question. Mm. What is what is that? The same one that asks that question. <laughs> it's, what, it's what allows the uh, tongue to taste and the eyes to see and the ears to hear, but can't be heard, seen, or tasted. Mm. Mm. This um, this title, wake up and roar. Uh, Tell me a little bit about that. What exactly is waking up and what is that that is roaring? Yeah. So think about waking up. I mean, of course, we all have the experience of waking up every morning. And when we wake up from the dream, it disappears. Now, while we're dreaming, it seems real. And you can get terrified in a dream or you can get turned on or you can become any variety of experience and emotion can happen while you're dreaming and it seems completely real. And when you wake up, where to go? You didn't kill the dream, you didn't do anything to the dream. You didn't work on the dream, you didn't fix the dream. You didn't even wake up from the dream. You just woke up and the dream's finished. If you go to find it, it's disappeared. When you wake up from the waking dream, it's just like that. It's not like you wake up to become something else. You just wake up from the dream. <laughs> do you, <laughs> the dreamer is always here. <laughs> do you wake up into another dream? Well, that's the trap, is the tendency is to wake up and then encapsulate it mm. in a concept. And then it becomes another dream. And it becomes a more spiritual dream, more enlightened dream. But it has a burden, it has a taste, mm. and it is... Uh, Ultimately, it leads to suffering. Mm. Mm. Very good. Now, what about this roaring stuff? What is that about? What's roaring? Okay, so it really comes from this uh, lesson that Papaji was giving in his teaching story in the book. And it's that one day, a washerman is carrying the village washing on the donkeys down to the river. And when he gets there, he sees a hunter shoot a lion and kill it and then skid it. And when the hunter left, the washerman found that the lion had been pregnant and the baby was still alive. And so he took the baby home and he nursed it. And he kept it growing stronger. And eventually the baby got big enough, he put it out with the donkeys. And eventually it got big enough, so the baby lion carried washing on its back along with the donkeys down to the river every day and would contentedly graze with the donkeys. One day, uh, real lion, an adult lion, a hungry lion, comes looking for food and sees donkeys and goes, whoa, donkeys, that's good meat. But then sees a lion eating grass next to the donkeys. Mm. Can't believe it. So he comes, run, comes bounding out of the bush. Everybody runs away. He catches the young lion. And the young lion says, oh, please don't eat me. Please don't eat me. Let me go back to my brothers, the donkeys. He says, you're not a donkey, you're a lion. He says, no, sir, no, I am a donkey. I carry washing every day. And so this big lion takes the little one down to the river and says, now, look in the water. Look at your face and look at mine. And what do you see? The little baby lion says, they're the same. He says, that's right. Now open your mouth and roar. And he roars. It's finished. Mm. He didn't become a lion. He just woke up to the reality that he is a lion. So there's all levels of waking up, you know, there's levels of realization. And that's what the essence of it is. So then when you wake up and roar in your own experience, it's not about vocally necessarily roaring, although it might be, mm. but it's being so true to yourself that in spite of what the consequences might be, you stand in the truth. Mm. You stay true to yourself no matter what. And that's a roar. Mm. It's rare in this world when everybody's asleep and believing they're awake and believing that they're doing the right thing. Everyone believes they're doing the right thing. Everybody. Mm. 
everybody. It's part of the dream. Mm. Yeah. And what is the what is the right thing? Is there as Shakespeare said there is no good and bad, but thinking makes it so. There you go. So stop thinking and the discussion's over. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Um you know, Papaji's to me, Papaji's most salient words were uh, keep quiet, keep quiet. Um, could you explain that to a layman or to just to somebody who never heard that before, never heard of Papaji? What, is, what does he mean by keep quiet? Okay, well, thank you. So when I started my spiritual search, I was checking out all the teachers. I'd already had a deep awakening from psychedelics and being a federal, federal fugitive in the moment, the pressure of that, facing death, waking up. But I, it was this, these were the days before the gurus, before the Tibetans had come to America. The first guru was Maharishi who came with the Beatles, and that was 67, 68. So this was you know, right around that time. So I, I was searching, and everybody I met whether it was Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi, Christian, Native American, always had a program and something to do. And I did them. I did sweat lodges with the medicine pipe holder, the Arapaho, beautiful. I loved it. I loved praying this way. But it wasn't about final awakening. And I went to, you know, I was a Buddhist. I ran the first Tibetan Buddhist meditation center for Kala Rinpoche, because he had a dream about me and made me the president when I really wasn't even that into it. But <laughs> it happens, and you know, I, it was, I was in a Zen monastery in Japan. I was initiated into a Sufi circle in Morocco. And everywhere I went, they gave you something to do, some practice to get better, to get more awake. No one ever mentioned in this moment, you can wake up and be yourself by simply stopping everything else. No one never said that. It was never about stopping something. It was always about starting something or continuing something, practicing something. Even when it was practicing not, it was like, oh, practice to be more compassionate and practice to not be so hurtful, and whatever it might be, whether it's zazen or doing prostitution or dancing in a circle. There's always some practice. But to stop, this is Papaji's radical transmission, that there's nothing you have to do. You have to be willing to stop. And most people are not willing to stop. They're too attached to the motion. They're too attached to the terror of stopping. Stopping is dangerous because it means the end of the dream. And if you're enjoying the dream, you're getting off in the dream, even if you're suffering the dream, you don't want it to end. And so you say, oh, let me sleep a little bit longer. And finally, you're not, it's not satisfying. You've had enough good times, enough bad times mm -hmm. to know that you'll never get fulfilled from the dream, no matter how spiritual you are in it, mm -hmm. how whatever it is, how successful you are, how much money you have, how much sex you have, whatever it is, it's never enough. The dream is never fulfilling. So finally, you're ready to wake up. And to wake up, you don't fight with the dream, you don't change it, you don't fix it. You simply stop. And in this moment, full stop. Full stop. I love it. <laughs> is 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 this concept of um well it's beyond concept but is this available to everybody um i've heard uh, you know notions like uh, karma and reincarnation and we have these these journeys is, is this is this full stop available to everybody who's watching this right here right now absolutely no question no doubt if you have the capacity to watch this, you have the capacity to stop. It's that simple. You don't have to 
have practiced anything or become anything. You don't have to be bitter. You don't have to be more anything or less anything. Simply as you are, you already are immortal consciousness, timeless, spaceless, formless. All it takes is your willingness. Most people aren't willing because they're too attached to what they think they're going to get if they stay plugged in to the hustle. Because it's all the hustle. It's all about getting something. Either more, better, or different. More, better, different. Oh, I don't want this one, I want that one. Oh, that's a better one, that's a newer one, or that's hotter, or that's sexier, that's whatever it is. There's always more, better, different. It keeps us from the willingness to say enough. Enough. I don't have to go there anymore. That's not where I would find fulfillment. And that doesn't mean becoming something else. When people say, oh, well, if I stop, then I'll become like a hermit on the mountain. Mm -hmm. No, you won't. If you were that lucky, you would have done it already. <laughs> so people think that's bad news. It's actually the good news, but that's not for most of us. Right. Most of us are stuck here in the material world, and that's not going to change. But how do you live here? How do you show up here? If you show up as a slave, you're suffering. Mm -hmm. And showing up as a slave doesn't mean throwing rocks against it. Because throwing rocks against it, you're still a slave. The jailers and the ones in prison are all slaves in the same system. There's really no difference. Some have more perks. And if you're in the game for perks, you won't leave. But if you're willing to walk out, it's a jailbreak. It's home free. Everybody has the capacity to stop and be still right now. Mm. Um, you mentioned earlier that you, um, you know, you talked about the, the gurus and does, does one need a guru, um, to, for enlightenment, for confirmation of, of, of that, this full stop? Okay. So here's the deal. Ramana Maharshi is my guru's guru. Mm -hmm. And he woke up as a 16-year-old boy because he became afraid of dying. Now, at the time, his father had just died shortly before. The family was poor. They were broken up. He and his brother were sent to live with an aunt. And today, if there were money in the family and the father died, you'd get grief counseling. You'd get different kinds of therapy to help you get through it. That wasn't happening then, of course. And so when he became afraid of dying, there wasn't any support to look at it or do anything about it. He decided to find out who dies. And so he laid down on the ground. He went inside. He held his breath and dove inside. And he woke up and realized, I don't die when the body dies. That was his enlightenment. That wasn't the end. That was the beginning. He was still a high school student. He still went about his daily things, except he would sit down to do his homework and he'd fall into bliss. And he had no motivation to be in school anymore. And one day his brother who was there, they're living in their aunt's house, and his brother says, hey, you're eating their food and you're acting like a, a, you're act, yeah, you're acting like a yogi. Why, what are you doing here if you're eating their food? Either stop and do your homework or eat it. And so he ran away from home. Now, at that point, you know, child services could get called or there'd be some search for them. They'd bring them and give them counseling or send them up in a different home. You know, that's not what's happening here. Just 16-year-old kid runs away onto the street and he steals his brother's three rupees that was there on the kitchen table for his brother's tuition. So he's a thief and a runaway. Right? And now he knows he has to find his father. And so he goes off to find this holy mountain that he'd read about in a book. And when he read it in the book, he fell into rapture. And he knew he had to go there, and that was his father. He left a note for his mother. I've gone off to find my father. Please don't expend any energy or any time looking for me. And my brother's tuition has not been paid. And then he was gone. When he got to his holy mountain, he never left the rest of his life. 
he fell in love with Arunachala, this holy mountain that he saw as the embodiment of Shiva. Mm. That was his guru, that was his father. And he stayed at his guru's side for the rest of his life. And he didn't want disciples, he didn't want devotees, he didn't want to have a teaching, he didn't want to spread it. He just wanted to be by himself. He stayed in silence for years. Once when his mother finally found out where he was after he'd been gone for a while, she went to bring him home. And she said, come on, if you want to meditate, come to your room, meditate in your room. Now let me take care of you, let me feed you. Because mm -hmm. he was living on the street, he had no clothes, he had no money, he had nothing. He was really had nothing and didn't want anything. And she'd come, for three days she came and cried in front of him, and he never spoke. He'd been in silence since he got there. Finally, on the third day, he wrote her a note. He said, whatever it will be, will be, no matter how we try to stop it. And whatever won't be, won't be, no matter how we try to force it. It's so better to just be still. Mm -hmm. That's his first teaching, and it's the teaching of stillness. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon, people started taking care of him. Other swamis in the temples would feed him and wash him and take care of him. And this went on for many years where he didn't speak and people just took care of him. Mm. Eventually he went up to live in a cave on this holy mountain and a little ashram formed around him, groups of people who just wanted to sit in his presence. And eventually he started speaking again, just naturally. And his first teaching was, who are you? Find out. You are the deathless, formless self. Realize this and you're free. And so my teacher, Papaji, was one of his students. And the difference is Papaji was a householder. Papaji had a wife and kids and a job and was supporting his extended family that he helped bring out of the Punjab, the partition. And so he took this transmission of silence into the marketplace. He would take us into the marketplace and show us in the midst of the pollution and the noise and the animals and Everybody shouting, and exhaust fumes, and fires burning. There was absolute silence, absolute purity. Nothing touched the silence, nothing touched the truth. And so this was Papaji taking it into the marketplace, and he was this fire that sent out sparks around the world to see who would catch it. And this is how satsang started. It's not how satsang started, but it's how it started in our incarnation in the West. In my 18-year spiritual search through the world, I never heard of satsang. I heard of zazen and all kinds of names of darshan and whatever, but not satsang. And now there's satsang everywhere we go. What does that word mean, satsang? It means sitting with truth. It means sat is from the uh, Hindu understanding of who we are as self, sat is immortal being. And sang is sangha, and it's the same root as community. So it's being in communion with immortal being. Okay. And so what that comes down to is the sat guru is the one who is the guru of sat. Sat is immortal being. So sitting with the sat guru is sitting in satsang. That's its real meaning to receive the transmission of freedom from your teacher. That's satsang. Does everybody need a teacher? Not necessarily. I did though. And I was a really relatively awake. I was teaching, I had written many books, and not many books, I wrote several books. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was successful as a teacher. I was helping people, but it wasn't finished. I needed a teacher. I needed someone who was more awake than I was that could confirm me and stop my mind. Mm. My mind would stop if I was teaching. If I was in a group, your mind stops. If you're teaching, your mind stops quite naturally. If you're making love, your mind stops if you're lucky. But then it starts again. Mm -hmm. And Papaji's transmission is that it's not about starting and stopping, it's really finishing. This this con this finishing, um, 
we we know we are finished when the desire to finish ends. <laughs> yeah, sure. When there's no desire, because you're all so fulfilled, you're full filled. So you're overflowing of fullness. Mm. So there's no, what else can you need? What else could you want? Mm. So you're so happy with yourself as you are. Mm. You're not searching for anything. Mm. You're not needing anything. Mm. Then you're truly in service because you don't need anything back. You're not giving to get. See, most people say, I, I love you, means I love you because of what you do for me. I love you because of the way you treat me. I love you because of the way you take care of me. I love you because of the way you love me. Or I love you because you're mine. You're my parents. I have to love you. You're my children. You're part of me. So it's really not love at all. It's all selfish. It's all basically based in what am I going to get back? But true love, if you're already fulfilled, you don't need anything back. Just love as it is, as you are indiscriminately because Indis yeah. oh no I wouldn't say indiscriminately okay so that's really that's another good thing I'm really glad you mentioned that mm -hmm. because people think it's like indiscriminate love means oh you know I love you the same way I love you the same way I love you the same way I love my computer it's not like that mm -hmm. that's not true I mean I love my partner in ways that I don't love anybody else mm -hmm. because it's just a different depth and a different tenderness and We've been together for more than half my life. I can't believe it. I never wanted to be with anybody. But here I am. And so, of course, I love her differently. Mm. That doesn't mean that I hate you or I can't love you. It's like there's not, it's not exclusive. But there's some things that are exclusive. My relationship with my partner is exclusive. Mm. But why not? See, people think that emptiness or Everything included means it's all the same, like custard mush. It's not all the same. Everything is distinct. There's infinite variety of detail and distinctness. And that separation of distinction is beautiful. That's also included in love. What's your definition of love? Uh, your nature. Because love is what's under the emotional body. So most of us live in the most surface emotions. Our emotions aren't even real emotions. For most people, we live in emotions created by the story of our situation. Mm -hmm. By that I mean, okay, you are making me upset because, or you really hurt me because, or that frustrates me, or what you're doing makes me angry. And all of that is superficial story mentally generated false emotions, mm. generally in the realms of hurt, sadness, anger, and the varieties of that. So you don't say I'm sad, you just say I'm just lonely, or I'm not afraid, I'm just cautious. But those are the varieties of the superficial. Then there's actual the animal emotions. And the every animal in the kingdom has emotions. Rage is an animal emotion. Fear is an animal emotion. Sadness animal emotion. So you can see the animals have emotional bodies just like we do. And that's our animal nature. But underneath, if you're willing to fall through the bottom, the very, you get down deep enough, it becomes despair and depression, and pointlessness and hopelessness. This takes a certain amount of introspection to get to that level. Most people aren't introspective enough to be in hopeless despair. But if you are, if you're intelligent enough and you look inward, how could you not be hopeless despair when you see the situation you're in? And so that's where people get depressed and then they get medications, they get off the depression, they're given activities and hobbies, whatever it is to distract you from your depression. But if instead you go deeper into the depression, into the despair, there's this terrifying black hole at the bottom. It's the end of everything. It seems like death. If you fall into that, you fall into love, emptiness, spaciousness. 
I just read an incredible book by a prisoner, a guy who's doing life without parole mm -hmm. in the California state system. Mm -hmm. And when he was at the end of it, he was a gangster and he was a bad kid. He was, he, when he, he stomped the guy to death in the park just because he was mean and bad. And uh, at a certain point, he went in, he was like this tough guy in prison. He moved up the gang hierarchy. But he was diagnosed with AIDS. And they put him in segregation. He'd been in the hole a lot. But now he's facing his own death. And he's lost everything. He's cut off from his girlfriend. He's cut off from all communication. And he goes inside into this despair. And he falls into it. And he says, it's like I fell into dying. He didn't have any meditation practice. He didn't have any spiritual books. He fell into dying and fell through it. And he said it was like he was floating in this golden liquid. And he saw that he was connected with everyone. And he saw that this changed his whole life. He gave up his whole gang perspective. And he kept plunging. He said, I love that. And he kept going into it. He kept going back into falling into this death and floating. Mm -hmm. Each time he came back, he was renewed in a certain way. And from then on, he became a changed person. And his goal in life at that point was to set up a safe space in the prison to make one of the yards non-gang, non-drug. And this was, he was in Soledad, Folsom, San Quentin, mm -hmm. and the, the heavier ones after that, and he, he said there was such a nightmare of violence that he had been part of. He'd stabbed people in prison. But yeah. now he wanted a yard where there was no guns, no violence, no drugs, where people could just be themselves, where there was no racial divide. And he set it up. Hmm. And it worked for six years until the Republicans shut down the prison program and pulled out everything. Hmm. But it worked. And so then he actually partitioned and got... Congress, state legislature in California passed a law allowing for an honor yard, which is what he called it, the honor yard. But uh, Governor Schwarzenegger uh, vetoed it. Mm. He's still in prison. He's mm. still working on this beautiful wow. man. Wow. And so he discovered this truth of the black hole inside of his emotional body mm. just by uh, being at the end of the line. And then finds out, oh, you really don't have AIDS. Mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> wow. Hmm. That reminds me of that story. Uh, oh God, it's been so long since I've heard this. The, 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 the master tells the, the student he's gonna die. He, he, the, the student wants enlightenment so bad. And for years and years, um, he, he, he doesn't get it. He, he, he continues to want it, um, want it. But I, I, I might be blurring stories, but the, the master is like, you know, you're going to, he says, if, if you don't get enlightenment in a week, kill yourself because it won't happen. That's what he said. And so, uh, after four days, he finally, he, he, he gets it, he becomes it. Um, it's, it's like this, this thing about death. Um, one of my favorite books is the Tibetan book on living and dying. Um, and in it, I think it was the Buddha. He says, uh, he says, don't think, but if you must think, let it be on the uncertainty of your death. Uh, this, this thing about dying, it brings us so close to, to this moment um, in fullness for true fulfillment. That's a great, great story. What's that book called um, that you that you read? Oh, I'd love to wish I, I gave it to Gangaji to read, and I don't remember the name of it now. I'll, 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 okay, I'll get well, it. Well, let, let me know when you when you. Uh, I will let you know. Okay. 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 okay mm -hmm. Very good. Um, a few minutes ago, you mentioned uh, your relationships or your relationship, and it's exclusive. Um, how does um, how does this understanding affect 
your romantic relationships? Let's see. What does romance really mean, romantic relationships? You have to look at what it is. So I just saw a lecture, an interesting thing. That actually, the word romance comes from translation into French, but it had with it the certainty of longing and desire and suffering. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Yep. And so, you know, if you're in that game, yeah. that's what you get. There's pleasure and pain. Because mm -hmm. generally what we fall in love with is not really what's lovable. We fall in love with the way it looks, the way it feels, the way it sounds, the way it smells, the way it tastes. Yeah. But that changes. And so when we fall in love at that level, it's really falling in lust. Mm -hmm. And then if you go a little deeper and you fall in love, you still, you're falling in love with a projection of yourself. Whether mm -hmm. it's your mother or your father or your idealized other, it's a projection. Eventually, someone else comes out from behind that screen. And you go, whoa, what were you doing here? <laughs> I thought I fell in love with the other one. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, because when you're in the uh, mating mode, you're doing your mating dance, you're showing the behaviors that are going to be attractive to the other. So you're on your best behavior, whatever that might be. Whatever you think is going to be attractive, that's your mate, mating dance. And so that's what you'll do. You know? yeah. so there's a great story of um, these birds in Australia called bower birds, where the males all get into like a big open clearing and they build nests. And each one makes an art piece, hmm. really an art piece. One will gather all these red flowers and arrange them in a certain way and put blue flowers next to it. And then these little shells that it collects from someplace else and leaves from over here. And they make these incredible art pieces, yeah. not to live in, but just really to show. And then the females come along and they judge them. And if the wow. <laughs> show wins, hey, you get to have sex. And then you don't do it anymore. It's like, she thought she married an artist. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's, that's okay. <laughs> so how, how, what are the dynamics of, I guess, is there romance in your relationship? Yes. You know, hey, listen, when we started out, I was 28 years old, you know? So when I was 28 years old, I'd never, I had been married once for nine months. I'd never had children. I made a vow never to have children when I was 10 years old, and I was keeping that vow. Mm. And so I had no family. I had no responsibilities. I was, I liked being alone. I liked traveling alone. I liked having casual relationships where everybody was up front, and it was fun. I was into fun. I wasn't interested in long-term relationship. I didn't see the point of it. I saw it as a, Property, so marriage is a property relationship hmm. based on my Marxist understanding. It's just about power and property. And so I didn't want to play that game. And since I wasn't having children, I didn't have to. And so I could be free. And I was. And this is the 70s. It's pre-AIDS. So everybody was making love with everybody else. So we call it making love as if you're making love. There's no making and there's no love. It's fun. It's sex. It's pleasurable. I loved it. I loved it. I wanted to have sex with everybody. But then I got caught. <laughs> I fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> with someone who had fallen in love with me. And she wouldn't let me go. Hmm. When we were, it was 1976. We were living in a communal household. We each had a bedroom in a communal household. We went for a walk up to Bass Lake outside of Bolinas on the coast swimming naked and stoned. We made love after the swim. And I fell in love. I saw, I told her, I said, you are the clearest expression of light I've ever seen. And I fell in love with that. And that was 1976. This is now 2016. And she's still the clearest reflection of light I've ever seen. Mm. So... <laughs> I didn't, but listen, it took us 13 years before I agreed to get married. 
I mean, we lived together for 13 years and we tried everything. We had an open relationship, closed relationship. We, had, we tried everything mm. because I, didn't, I was not monogamous. I told her from the get-go, some people have the monogamous gene and some don't. Just like in the animal kingdom, some are monogamous, some aren't. And even in the animal kingdom, the ones that are monogamous cheat. Yeah. So that's, that's the way it is. And I always was very open about that. But then I, had a, I saw the trap of that also. I saw it was actually causing suffering. Hmm. And then the question for me was, you know, am I willing to cause suffering for my pleasure? Yep. Hmm. And I wasn't. So <laughs> by the monogamy line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know. um, what inspired this this project? Um, you know, the wake up and roll. What inspired you to want to kind of rekindle and create an audio version of the book? What was what was where did that come from? I really, it comes from my true desire that everyone wake up and be free. This has been my life mission now, most of my life. I've done everything I could in every way that I could to pass on the message of freedom to whoever I defined it. I mean, freedom has changed radically. When I was 18 years old and we went, I went to Montgomery with the marches, I was terrified. I was facing possible death, but I was there because I believed in freedom. I believed that at that point, in that stage, 1965, I believed that everybody had the right to vote. And I'd seen the dogs in Selma and it was while that was happening, when Reverend Reeve was beaten to death in Selma the day before we arrived in Montgomery, where SNCC was doing counter marches with Dr. King in Selma. So it was really a test, a test of your willingness to stay true to this desire for freedom. Mm -hmm. It was choiceless to get on that bus to go to Alabama. But then, once I got on the bus, the test got harder and it's more of a challenge. And it was more of, are you willing to step off this cliff? And each time I was willing to step off the cliff into the unknown for freedom, the nature of freedom changed. The quality of freedom changed. Until so finally I realized the truth of freedom. And I knew that if everybody could realize what I realized, the world would be free. And so that became my mission. That's why I started my spiritual search. January of 1972. It took me 18 years to the day, January 19th of 1990, that I knocked on my teacher's door. I finally found freedom the capacity to pass it on. See, I was already relatively quite free, but I couldn't pass it on mm. because I'm still unfinished business with my mind. And so that had to stop. It's really not about becoming someone else, it's becoming yourself by being willing to end the veiling of yourself. Mm. And the this, comes of through, this comes through practice. Is, it, is there a... Um, a remembering, a constant remembering, or is there a, a constant awareness? Well, how does that work? Papaji said, as long as there's a body, there's vigilance. Mm -hmm. So it's not practice or remembering. It's the intelligent, awake, willingness to not move back into the trap, to not take the next step, mm -hmm. as harmless as it might seem. And then you do, you try it, you take the next step and what seemed harmless turns into a monster, a nightmare. And so then you learn from it, you can gain wisdom. Yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. We all fall off, you have to fall off and you don't learn. You know, we don't learn from our successes, we learn from our failures. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> it. Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. That's it. That's it. <laughs> The, the the failure really brings you closer to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 when you're when you're winning, you're comfortable. Like, ah, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. But when you when things go wrong, 
you know, that's when you really have to deal um, and, and come into contact with that, with, with what you are. You know? Yes. What would, what would Papa G, um, how, how would his teaching relate to the current political environment today? What, what, what do you think he would say to a, a Donald Trump, for instance? Papaji was a Punjabi Hindu of his generation. He had a completely different worldview. You know? His issues were with the Muslims in the Punjab. So, yeah, it's not. Papaji was always for freedom and for democracy. And so now, when our freedom and democracy is being threatened, he, at his time, when he had to do, he, he was being trained as an officer in the Indian army under the British. And so that was after World War I. But then as a nationalist thing started in India, he dropped out. He gave up his commission as a captain in the army, which his wife never forgave him for. And he joined the underground against the British for a while. And they actually set up a bomb to blow up a train, but it didn't happen, didn't work. But he, that was his response at the time. Okay. Okay. Um, this this um, freedom that you speak of, do you, do you, I think your exact words were you, you, your mission is to... Um, well, I think now it's it's paraphrased for me, but it's to allow the whole world to be free. Right? Yes. What does that look like? Unknown. Mm. How could we know? Is it the, the abandonment of... The future is unknown. Mm. You know, all we can do is put mind projections into the unknown and to tell ourselves stories. So we, Papaji said, wait and see. Wait and see. Yes. <laughs> That's great. Wait and see, I love that. I love that. Hmm. Keep quiet, wait and see. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> right there. That's it, that's it. Um, hmm. Freedom. Do you, do you I'm, I studied anthropology and um, during my studies, we learned about um, a concept called linguistic relativity or also known as the superior war of hypothesis, which means language affects the way that we view the world. Um, for instance, if uh, a great example is if I, if you go into a place and you think it's a junkyard, everything you see is scrap metal. If somebody tells you, no, that's not a junkyard, that's an art gallery. Everything you see becomes a work of art, right? Language. That's called reframing. Say that again. What you just did was called reframing. Reframing. And that's a, a it's reframing. It's a successful strategic intervention in therapy. Is you, you know, reframe the situation. Mm. But yes, it's because our language creates the reality. So we're not living in reality. We're living several steps removed. Mm. We're living in our story of reality, and that story is living in the embedded language of reality. And so we're living in a trance within a trance within a trance. Mm. <laughs> so if this world is to become uh, free, how important is language or go coming beyond words to that? You know, here's the thing. Language is crucial because it's the linguistic mind that returns to its source. And so we all have language, and in that language there's a certain identity of self. There's a certain 
I that arises linguistically. And that is the conscious construction that has to return to find out who am I. And so the problem with not having language is that I've seen so many people who would receive the transmission from Papaji, but because they didn't have the proper understanding, it didn't last. Hmm. And you see the people who went to see Ramana, thousands and thousands of people would file through to see him, to receive his transmission. And they would get something. They would have profound realizations or profound experiences of bliss. Not realizations, experiences of bliss. Mm -hmm. And then they would pass. So what the language does is it allows the consciousness to focus itself back on itself without skipping off in another direction because you can have a language you have the language to call it like if we can't name it we don't have any way of seeing it to have insight into it mm -hmm. there's a great book by the way speaking of linguistics man you, a book you will love and must read called don't sleep there are snakes don't sleep there are snakes yeah okay. and it's this tribe in uh there's a tribe in the Amazon that that's what they say. Instead of saying good night, sleep well, they say don't sleep, there are snakes. Okay. And so this tribe doesn't have concept of numbers. So they don't have a language for numbers. They can't learn numbers. Mm -hmm. People try, I mean, this guy goes down as a, to convert them, but in order to convert them, he has to write their dictionary. And to write their dictionary, he has to really get into their culture. It's, mm. it's part of the Chomsky school, but mm. then turns against Chomsky because these people don't have the recursive, um, I forget what it's called, the recursiveness in their language structure, which Chomsky said was inherited and genetic. And so all that aside, it's an incredible story about these people who are living in paradise. They, he asked, do you know why we come here? Says, yeah, because the people say, yeah, because we live in the best place in the world. We have clean water, we have all the food we want. But they have no culture as we know it. They don't make tools. They don't make baskets to last. They don't make houses to last. Everything is impermanent. They have no past or future, really. They live in the moment. But they're living in the moment without numbers. But when the Portuguese traders would come down the river, they would get cheated. And they knew they were being cheated because they couldn't do math. Hmm. But as hard as they tried, they couldn't say two and two is four. Hmm. They, didn't, they couldn't make that connection. And so that's the power of language. So you see the good news and the bad news of it is we live in a past and a future which causes suffering. They don't. Like they say, okay, we're here to teach you about Jesus. And they say, okay, have you ever met Jesus? They said, no. So forget about it. We're not interested. <laughs> <laughs> that's how far back they'll go if you know somebody who knows somebody then I thought, well, I'll hear you otherwise forget about it mm. they have no founding mythology mm. they don't have founding they don't have music they don't do it's like wow. they don't have poetry wow. living in the moment huh. and it's um, you know it's got its drawbacks that's a, okay interesting. that's very interesting I will look that book up. Wow. No music. It's a great, it's a great read. Wow. I'll check it out. I'll check it out. Well, look, I, I enjoyed this thoroughly. Um, Me too. Well, I, I don't know if my audience is going to enjoy it. I'm sure they will, but this was really for me. I enjoyed just having this conversation and uh, I'm sure we're going to edit it real nicely and present it to to millions of people and hopefully we can uh we can really build some 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 traction and bring some eyes to to you and to papa g and i'm, I'm very excited I'm very excited thank you so much i love seeing you i love your good heart i love your sweetness you know i think i've got a bromance going with you my boy <laughs> <laughs> my son likewise likewise <laughs> You know, and I'll tell you, that's mm, just feel like my son. Mm. When Papa G said that to me, it was one of the most blissful things that ever happened in my life. Mm. And I just, it's, it's being passed on. It's really his heart. Mm. Same heart. Mm.